Does it look good? Yeah, it looks great. Michael Bloomfield was a very old friend of mine. I knew him from the time I was a teenager until uh, the end. Uh, and I had developed a very close friendship with him over our interest in music, books, and sort of everything. Uh, everything in the world. We were interested in all sorts of things. He would, uh, I would say I was interested in something and then I would get a, a bundle of books that uh, he had already read because he wouldn't, he had so many interests and so I would get a bundle of books on that subject. He was just the most extraordinary person. He was outrageous, he was brilliant and uh, he was very humane and he was hilarious. He um, was a real artist and um, we shared confidences and, you know, the, uh, I think I even, you know, he did a very special thing for me. He even, he even taught me how to eat fire, which was, uh, I think, one of his secret tricks. I don't know how many people, other people he taught, but he did teach me to, how to eat fire. I was fortunate enough to see him in the Butterfield Blues Band at the trip on the Sunset Strip. I saw the incredible performance of the Whiskey A Go Go, of the electric flag, where you know all the stars were lined up to see him, and it had double drumming so Buddy Miles could sing. Buddy Miles was wearing the silk flag shirt, the electric flag was blowing, and Michael let it rip. There was nothing like it, and he, he truly was unique. I also was very close to Andy Warhol, starting at about the same time. A number of years later, I moved to New York where I was working at my career as a fashion designer, and uh, I was uh, given a part as one of the very bad girls in Andy Warhol's big budget movie, Andy Warhol's Bad. It, it was uh, a high budget for the movie, uh, he'd never done anything with high budget like that, a script that was followed, and it starred uh, the last of the actresses that worked with all the great directors in the studio system, Carol Baker. And uh, all the top talent was used. We had the crew that had just worked on Godfather 2 and Network. Top talent was used throughout. And when it came to selecting the person for the score, many people were lobbying for it. Lou Reed, of course, you know, very much wanted to be doing the score. People like Rod McEwen said he'd do it for free. Many, many professional scorers, you know, put their hat in the ring. And I, because I was close to everybody in the production, threw in Bloomfields. Now, this was, you know, considered perhaps not the typical choice because of course Lou Reed, you know, supposedly would have the inside track. But at the end of the day, Judd Johnson, the director, and at, with Andy's final approval, Michael Bloomfield was picked and did the score for Andy Warhol's Bath. And I was there when they met in New York. Michael Bloomfield and Andy Warhol did meet two of the great 20th century artists. And Bloomfield was very, very funny with Andy because I never saw anybody talk to Andy like Michael did. Michael was this real truth teller and he was fearless and he said to Andy all these things that people would of course like secretly say behind his back and he said, him, they, he said to them directly to him but because he was such an unusual person he was able to make these truths, and they were nothing but truths, turn into something very positive. So at, by the end of the meeting, Michael had uh, turned things that seemed like it was going to be a debacle into you know, something where everybody was feeling very good about themselves. He did what I think was a very beautiful score. He always told me that um, he wanted to be singing 
but you know he couldn't sing so you know his guitar did the singing and it's a it's a lilting score he had asked to have Irving Berlin's Marie uh, acquired so he could use it as the main theme for the movie so the lawyers went and they said you know Irving Berlin's 90 years old and Irving Berlin's the most famous songwriter in the history of uh, the world and to acquire this is going to be next to impossible so he told me this and I said you know Michael can't you just you know nick it uh, but he did his own version and it doesn't sound anything like Marie the theme for bad and without anybody asking for it he went and did something that everybody loved including Andy which was a single called Andy's Bad and because this was 1977 and uh, the disco era uh, the single which uh, was unreleased Roger Birnbaum um, who became a very famous producer was very much trying to get it released through Arista Records but nothing ever came of it but the single had a disco disco tone and flavor to it and here's the demo for as a Andy's bat as Michael Cole. <laughs> and at the end um, bat opened uh, with a big premiere in Westwood in Hollywood and there there were 700 people there including those biggest stars of the moment like Jack Nicholson, Warren Beatty, Julie Christie, uh, all, everybody you can possibly imagine coming out for the big Andy Warhol movie uh, and George Cukor the famous Golden Age director who directed part of Gone with the Wind was there it was quite the scene with you know blocks of people lined up and that Saturday night after a week of parties and dinners was a big blowout party uh, to be held in uh, a 1920s mansion in Hancock Park neighborhood in Hollywood uh, so I called up Bloomfield and he said you know he, he lives in Marin County and he he, you know, was really anti-materialism and anti-Hollywood parties in a way. But uh, he said, you know, I will come to the party if you get Randy Newman to come. And I said, oh, you know, you know, I'll tell them. So I, you know, told the people in charge. And the next thing, you know, I knew they said, oh, you know, Randy Newman's coming to the party. So I called Bloomfield and said, oh, you know, Randy Newman's coming to the party. And I didn't say anything else, and I really, really, you know, I didn't really think about him coming to the party. It just really wasn't part of my thoughts. I just thought it would not happen, and I didn't think about it. And so I went to the party, and it was, you know, an incredible Hollywood party. And East Coast meets West Coast, the, you know, New York meets Hollywood, and everybody, you know, from the A-list stars to the beautiful kids to the people, you know, involved in the movie to, you know, it was just a roaring, roaring, roaring party, and I had been there about two hours, and I was in the, like, you know, the living room, it was, it was quite dark, all the rooms were dark at the party and out into the garden and around the pool and standing there beaming at me was Bloomfield. So, you know, for the next 20 minutes, uh, half hour, Bloomfield, you know, was by my side to the Hollywood party. Of course, you know, he didn't ask to meet Randy Newman. He, he didn't mention Randy Newman at all. And all the, you know, Hollywood personages were, you know, all around us. And the one that he became transfixed by was, of course, for the fire-eating Michael Bloomfield, the most bizarre-looking person in the room, which was the unknown at that time, just beginning to be known through pumping iron, the 
gigantic at that time, Arnold Schwarzenegger, just off the uh, circuit of bodybuilding with his like, you know, 53 inch chest and 22 inch arms. So that like was like a freak show for Bloomfield and that's what he loved. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger just was like, you know, so bizarre. He just found him so bizarre. Well, little he didn't live to see him be governor. But um, at any rate, after 20 or 30 minutes, he asked me to take him to the airport. So um, I left the party, took Bluefield to the airport. He flew up to San Francisco, and I went back to the party. And that's the end of the story. I hope you enjoy listening to the single, Andy's Bad. I love it. Thank you.